Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. On behalf of USAID, Feed the Future, and AgriLinks, I welcome you to our webinar, The Importance of Timely Analyses for Decision-Making During a Period of Crisis. I am Michael Saltz with AgriLinks. Before we begin, I want to orient you to the BlueJeans platform. On the right side of your screen, you'll see most of your controls. First, please use the chat to introduce yourself and network with colleagues from around the world. To ask questions, please use the Q&A button on the bottom right. Please indicate who your question is for or let us know if it's for the full group. Feel free to upvote questions you want answered and you can ask questions throughout the event. Our Q&A session will be at the end of the webinar. If the presentation is too small on your screen, you can use the slide bar at the bottom of the window to adjust the view. Lastly, we are recording this webinar and we'll email you the post-event resources as soon as they are available. You can also find the resources at agrilinks.org when they are ready. Thank you for your attention. I will now pass it to USAID's Alejandro Valencia. Good morning and welcome everyone. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, you guys want to get us started in practicing on the chat function, tell us kindly in the chat where you're connecting from. Um, as Michael said, my name is Alejandro Valencia. I am a knowledge management and organizational learning advisor at USAID's Resilience and Food Security um, Bureau, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Um, I am joined by a great panel today uh, that will be discussing the importance of timely analyses for decision making during a period of crisis in the context of this month's AgriLinks uh, theme month on the impacts of high food, fuel, and fertilizer costs. Uh, many of you might already have seen uh, these posts, but if you haven't, I really advise you to go to the Crisis in Focus page that we have there uh, with content related to the Ukraine uh, impacts, and it's on agrilinks.org. Uh, the link will be shared uh, uh, on the chat. Um, so I would like to pass it on uh, today. Oh, as, as I mentioned, uh, the first 60 minutes are going to be dedicated to presentations. Um, and then after that, we're gonna have 30 minutes uh, dedicated to any questions you may have. So uh, as we want to keep this interactive, please send us your questions via chat. Somebody from the lovely team at AgriLinks is going to uh, monitor that chat. Uh, so now I'd like to pass on the mic to Chris uh, Hilbrenner, uh, Division Chief of the Analysis and Learning Division at USA's Resilience and Food uh, Security Bureau. I would like to ask him to get us started with opening remarks. So Chris, can I please ask you to unmute? Great, thanks Alejandro. And welcome everyone. It's great to see uh, such a large turnout for this presentation. So as Alejandro mentioned, I'm the Division Chief for Analysis and Learning at USAID's Bureau for Security. And I'm excited to kick off today's discussion. As many of you are aware, the global food security situation we face today is daunting. Following a COVID-19 pandemic that pushed 100 million additional people into poverty and hunger, there have been a range of additional shocks over the last year, including restrictions on Chinese fertilizer exports and Russia's invasion of Ukraine that have driven global commodity prices to record levels. And Against this backdrop, timely analysis is critical for governments, donors, and for other stakeholders who are trying to make decisions about policy and about response. For example, given the range of shocks that's, that have occurred, which are likely to have the largest impacts on poverty, hunger, and malnutrition? Which populations are most affected? What tools and resources exist to help decision makers formulate their response? So today we have an excellent panel that I think can help us to start to answer these questions. We'll begin with remarks from James Thurlow, a senior research fellow at the International Food Policy Research Institute. And James will provide an overview of a series of country modeling exercises jointly funded by USAID and FCDO that aim to unpack how high global food, fuel, and fertilizer prices are impacting household well-being. 
James will then be followed by Usman Badian, the Executive Director of Academia 2063, who will hone in on the impacts of high commodity prices in Africa. And then Upendra Singh, the Head of Research at the International Fertilizer Development Center, will share his reflections on how we can support improved decision-making with regards to fertilizer use. Again, as Alejandro mentioned, following these presentations, we'll have an opportunity in discussion with panelists and our attendees, and then have closing remarks from Alan Toliveri from the Agriculture Research and Evidence Division at FCDO. So with that, a big thank you in advance to both our panelists and to our attendees. I think this is a critically important conversation as we grapple with the food security crisis before us. Uh, and with that, I'll hand the microphone off to James to kick off the presentation. Well, thanks, Chris. Um, as Chris mentioned, I'm going to um, present results from some recent estimates of ours on the impacts of the current crisis on poverty and food security in lower income countries. And this is work I'm, I, I head up IFPRI's country modeling team, but this is work done with many of my colleagues, including particularly Shinshen Diao and Paul de Roche. And this is work funded, as Chris said, by USAID, FCDO, and also the Gates Foundation. Next slide, please. So one of the key decision support tools that we use at IFPRI, that we have at IFPRI, are our models, our global and, and our country models. And these are particularly important tools for us in times of crisis, when we need to do rapid response analysis, when we are desperate to anticipate the impacts of, of a crisis and to think through what, um, what actions should be taken. And so this is the approach that we've taken in this series of country case studies that we're conducting um, uh, in a number of lower, low and lower middle, low, lower middle income countries. Um, we're using our economy wide, our country economy wide models to look at the impacts of world market shocks and to simulate um, what those economic impacts might be and to look at different policy response options. And this broadly defines this two-phased approach that we're taking. Um, much of the work that we've done um, uh, up until the end of June was estimating the impacts of the crisis on, um, on now 19 countries. And, um, and what we've been doing in July is looking at different policy options and thinking about what are some of the most cost-effective uh, ways of trying to reach all of the affected population groups. If you want more into in what I'm going to focus on today are, is just the impact assessments, because we don't have a great deal of time. So just the phase one results, those 19 countries results. If you want further information, you can uh, visit the IFPRI website and AgriLinks websites where we're going to talk about, where we talk about individual countries. Next slide, please. So um, what are the shocks, what are the impacts, and what are the outcomes that we are tracking or, or analyzing? So on the left-hand side, we talk about the shocks that are being accounted for in the analysis. We're looking at changes in world prices for food, fuels, and fertilizers, and we're imposing these world price shocks on the model. These are the drivers of change in our analysis. And you can see in the figure on the bottom left, these are the estimated uh, changes in prices from, uh, from the World Bank from June last year to the end of April this year, uh, broken down by two periods, before and after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, and you can see that, say, for wheat and for fertilizer, right on the far right-hand side, prices have doubled. They've increased by 100%. In the case of wheat, the green box is telling us that most of those price changes have happened since, um, since the beginning of February this year. And, um, but you can also see that much of the increase in fertilizer prices started last year. So we impose these shocks on the, the models. The question is what determines the impacts that we then observe within these tools that we are reporting? Well, there are a number of considerations that we need to take into account. The first is obviously what is the share of these affected commodities whose prices are rising in the total trade for individual countries? And that's gonna vary a lot. Generally speaking, though, for most low-income countries, fuel, petroleum products, are a very large share of the overall cost of imports for a country. And so changes in fuel prices can have very large economy-wide impacts on, on, on individual countries. Obviously, related to that is how important are those imports relative to domestically produced goods? So, for example, if you're Nigeria um, and you produce a lot of your own fertilizer, then changes in world fertilizer prices may be less important for you than they are for a country, let's say, like Malawi, that imports most of its fertilizer. 
Second, the same would go for wheat. So for example, a country like Egypt, which imports most of its wheat, um, might, not, might be worse affected by changing wheat prices than say a country like Egypt that produces more of its own wheat. The second question is how important are those commodities in the overall level of production or the consumer baskets in a country? And so what we find in many lower income countries, Egypt aside, that although wheat prices are rising, wheat itself and wheat flour and even bread are not a particularly large component in consumer baskets. I mean, there are population groups like urban households where bread is a more significant consumption item, but for remote rural households, that's less true. And so we need to take that into account. And then finally, you know, how much fertilizer were countries using before the crisis? And that'll determine how dependent their current levels of production are on, on fertilizer. Obviously related to that is how effective is fertilizer in raising crop yields and how sensitive is fertilizer demand to an increase in prices. So we're going to take that analysis into account. So we're not just looking at the immediate effects of rising world prices, but also the knock-on effects of higher fertilizer prices on um, fertilizer use and production. So we're thinking roughly what's happening to countries this year within this one year time horizon. The outcomes that we report include outcomes at the economy level, changes in national and agri-food system GDP, for example, as well as at the population or individual level, changes in poverty and food security. And here we're gonna look at hunger and diet quality as two key outcomes. I'm actually just gonna focus on the population outcomes in this presentation. Next slide, please. So we start with what are we finding in terms of the impacts of the crisis on poverty? And um, here poverty means is a household consuming enough to be above or below the, um, enough to be above the poverty line. And the poverty line here is the $1.90 a day uh, poverty line. On the right hand side is how we're going to be presenting the results in the next three slides. And so it's worth just spending a second inter understanding how to interpret it. So for example, on the right hand side on this slide, we're looking at the impacts of the world price changes on national poverty headcount rates, the share of the population below the poverty line. And you can see in the case of Bangladesh, which is the first country on this list of 19, that poverty goes up by 3.3%, as our model suggests that poverty goes up by 3.3% once we've taken all those considerations we discussed on the previous slide into account. And that translates to about 5 million more poor people in Bangladesh during, as a result of this crisis. We also decompose what's driving that increase in poverty. The brown bar is the increase in poverty driven by rising world food prices. The green is the fertilizer price increase, world fertilizer price increase, and the gray box is the rising fuel prices or petroleum products, oil broadly defined. And so what you can see here, for example, in the case of Bangladesh is that most of the increase in poverty is driven by rising food prices, but that is by no means true in every single country. There is a lot of variation across all of the countries that we're looking at, and that really cautions against drawing generalized conclusions about what the crisis means for low-income countries. What we do see, however, in across all 19 countries is an increase in poverty. Um, so this is definitely that worsens poverty. In, in developing countries. Across the 19 countries we look at, for example, there's a significant 27 million more people pushed into poverty as a result of these rising prices. If we dig a little deeper, we can see that most of the people falling into poverty are in rural areas, about three quarters of them. And we see that fertilizer prices are the main driver of, of the increase in rural poverty, incre uh, rural poverty, whereas it's fuel prices for urban poverty. I didn't show it here, but fuel prices are actually the major driver of declining economic activity overall across the entire economy. And that's because fuel is such an important uh, input into so many sectors, but particularly within the urban economy. What we can see here in this little bar chart at the bottom is that uh, rising fuel prices are a big driver of the increase in poverty, but it's broadly divided across the three, the rising food, fuel, and fertilizer prices. Next slide, please. The situation changes when we look at hunger. In most countries, again, we do see hunger rising um, in all of the countries that we look at. And again, we see very large variation across countries. When we talk about hunger, we're asking not as not the household's total consumption above the poverty line or below the poverty line, but is the household able to meet a minimum calorie consumption threshold? So we're starting to zoom in on very particular products, calorie heavy products, and obviously food products in particular. And so here we start to see how fuel prices, which affects the economy overall, is playing a less important role. And it's the fuel and the food and fertilizer price, or particularly the fertilizer prices, that are having a much larger effect. They're the primary driver of the increase in undernourishment. 
Um, and the reason for that is because our fertilizer is more directly affecting um, food production in countries and raising prices, particularly for the cereal intensive, uh, the calorie intensive crops. And so at the bottom, we can see that the rising fertilizer prices account for almost half of the increase in hunger as a result of the crisis. Same shocks, but we're looking at a different outcome and therefore different drivers have, um, have a different importance. Next slide, please. When we look at diets, we see diet deterioration across many countries. What do we mean by diet deterioration? Well, when we talk about diet quality, we're asking, does a household consume enough to meet the recommended levels of consumption um, across the six major food group, across six major food groups? And we're drawing, and we're gonna compare that basically to the recommended levels of consumption across these different food groups as estimated from the Eat Lancet diet. And what we see across countries, again, is diet quality worsening for many countries. What that means then is that more individuals are becoming deprived in at least one more, one additional food group. So if you were meeting um, the needs for all six food groups, now you might have five or food group, four, four food groups that you are meeting the needs of. And so you've become relatively more deprived. Your diet has deteriorated. What we do see here is that higher food prices overwhelmingly are driving the deterioration of diets. And the reason for that is that increase in edible oil prices which are particularly important for a, a healthier diet, um, but where many countries, many, um, and but the price of those edible oils have risen, rose dramatically during the crisis. And so this has had a knock-on effect, particularly on diets. I should emphasize that diet deterioration is not just amongst the poor. In fact, it's, it's disproportionately amongst the urban and the, um, and the non-poor, and that's because they had better diets to begin with, and therefore more scope for their diets to deteriorate. The opposite is true for the rural poor. Next slide, please. And so finally, what are the headlines? A quick summary of the impact analysis that I've presented today. Clearly, agri-food systems are being badly affected, disproportionately affected, but there's a lot of uh, country uh, variation, so we should avoid those generalizations. Large impacts on household welfare, particularly in rural areas. What we're seeing is that rising world fertilizer prices are really driving the increase in poverty and hunger, whereas it's rising world food prices that are uh, causing diets to deteriorate. A sneak peek of the policy analysis, because it draws directly on these findings, is we're finding that cash transfers are, um, are more effective at offsetting the poverty impacts, um, but we need those, those more precise uh, fertilizer and food uh, tax relief or subsidy interventions in order to address the hunger and the uh, diet deterioration uh, impacts more precisely. Short-term responses incur very high fiscal costs to fully offset some of the impacts that we've talked about today. Um, and there is a concern that this may prove unsustainable as we go into next year. It's imposing a very high burden on governments. And so there will be a need at some point to shift towards, or at least um, include in our portfolio of policy responses, interventions with a more medium term focus um, so that they last beyond the um, fiscal capabilities of the countries. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for the very interesting presentation, James. The, that level of disaggregation, these analyses are very important in the decision-making process to make more tailor-made interventions, uh, depending on the country and uh, the region and the uh, places within the country even. So as usual, I'm very impressed by your timekeeping skills. Um, as a reminder, uh, visit the AgriLinks IFPRI country level reports page that will also be shared in the chat. Uh, we're doing some great time, but I wanna make sure we get a good chunk of this uh, dedicated to the Q&A. So I would like to pass on the mic to our next presenter, uh, Usman Badiane. Uh, he will introduce some of the great work being done by Academia 2063, mainly on the studies on the impacts on commodity prices in African countries. So Usman, uh, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you, Alejandro, and uh, good morning and good afternoon to everybody. So this work I'm presenting today is looking at uh, the impact of the um, Ukraine crisis on uh, what started to be on the most exposed African countries. There were a couple that were added later, but we looked at countries in terms of uh, the exposure uh, to change in global uh, wheat markets that was the beginning of the work. It's been done by myself, uh, my colleague Ismail Kofana and Leisa Matisal. So we can go to the next page. Uh, what we've done here um, is to look at the combination of the different changes in global commodity uh, markets, uh, all 46, and we'll see them when they come, 
that are being tracked by the World Bank. We'll look at the changes in all those prices and what they do combined in terms of changes in terms of trade, uh, how countries uh, sell and buy goods across those 46 commodities where relevant. Then we translate that into the impact it has on growth and employment, poverty and food security. Uh, this gives us a much more comprehensive view of what's going on with the economies. Um, they um, uh, sell a bunch of commodities, they buy a bunch of commodities, and the combined effect of all of that is going to determine what's happening to them. And we cover the period 2022, 2023, and 2024. So in the next slide, uh, we look at um, how commodity prices have changed across the board, not just for food and fuels and fertilizers, but also for minerals, because many African countries are mineral exporters. So the bars you see in blue are how the World Bank projections saw prices to be in 2022 as of October 2021, uh, about three months or so uh, before the war broke out in Ukraine. And they updated their forecast in 2022, and those are the green bars. So what we are looking at here are the difference between the blue bars and the green bars are the changes in prices that we have modeled uh, in uh, in our work. So we can go to the next slide to see now how individual African countries are affected. On the left, you have the export price index change, the index of all goods that are exported by an individual African country. And on the right, you have the index of all goods imported by a given country and how those are affected by these changes across the 46 commodities. Uh, on the left, you have the um, export price index, the countries in green are all countries for which export price indices have gone up by five percentage points at most. On the other map, all those countries in yellow are countries for which the import price indices have gone up by 15 percentage points, three times as much. So most African countries are therefore facing a deterioration of their terms of trade. There's a lot to do with balance of trade and um, access to foreign exchange, uh, shortages of imports, and all the ramifications for the rest of the economy. And how that affects the economy is what we're going to see on the next slide, uh, the change of um, transmission of these effects into the economy. Change in terms of trade affects changes in domestic prices of tradables. Those are exported goods and they're competing, uh, those competing with imports and the non-tradable domestic goods like the threatening staples. Those changes in price ratios and price relations induce changes in demand and supply of goods and factors and therefore growth and employment, which then in turn change incomes and therefore poverty and food security and food consumption effects. So that's what we're looking at. Um, and the next slide, how we have prepared uh, the analysis to be able to isolate the impact of the crisis, we looked at two scenarios here. A scenario of pre-war, where we assume no major changes in the economy trajectories as of they were in the end of 2021, and see what will be uh, the trajectory in terms of growth, employment, poverty, and food consumption levels uh, through 2022 and 2024. Then we run another scenarios, including the changes across the 46 commodities and so what they mean in terms of uh, terms of trade changes and look at the disruptions in individual economies that results from that and how that affect the same growth, employment, poverty, food consumption levels and we compare the two. So in the next slides, uh, we highlight uh, the countries based on whether they are gaining from the terms of trade or they are losing. You remember me saying most African countries had less than five, but there were some who had more than five percentage points in changes in export price indices. So we have two groups of countries, those with positive terms of trades uh, in the green box and also the green colors, Benin, Ghana, Mozambique, Niger, and South Africa are facing more favorable export prices uh, compared to changes in import prices. And those with negative terms of trades who are changing less favorable import prices uh, compared to export prices. So the next slides that are going to come, the three give you an overview of the changes and I will comment uh, on those afterwards. 
We start first with the countries with improving uh, terms of trade uh, effects. Uh, here, Mozambique is the only country where you really have a huge consumer price index, this general inflation. We'll talk about the food inflation later. Um, then you have uh, in countries facing uh, deteriorating terms of trade, uh, most of them are facing much more higher inflationary levels. Uh, the impacts on incomes are much more steeper uh, in those countries compared to the countries with improving terms of trade. Some of them actually eke out a little bit of a better uh, positive income effect due to uh, changes uh, of facing more favorable export prices. Again, it's the overall economy and the overall uh, context of countries being able to seize uh, the opportunities created by high export prices for them. In the next slide, we look at uh, the uh, uh, food inflation effects. And here across the board, uh, countries with positive terms of trade as well as countries with negative terms of trade, food prices have gone up. And the most in a country like Mozambique, uh, and I'll come to the details to compare those countries, but also Uganda and Kenya here are facing the highest uh, food price inflation next to Malawi and Ghana, uh, which of course leads to reduction in food consumption levels, uh, very strong in Kenya uh, and Uganda, but also Malawi across those countries with uh, deteriorating terms of trade. Uh, among those with improving terms of trade, it's really negligible except in the case of, of Mozambique. In the next slide, we'll look at the poverty effects uh, across the same group of countries. And here uh, we have, uh, uh, looking at the uh, 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 cumulative effects of all these 46 commodities, uh, we have real changes in poverty here in Mozambique. Uh, in Nigeria, actually, if the economy is capable of responding and seizing the opportunities in the global markets and the export improvements, they will actually benefit a little bit in terms of the impacts on, on poverty. Uh, the countries facing deteriorating terms of trade uh, is highest in Kenya, Malawi, and Senegal, where poverty headcount index uh, go up uh, quite uh, significantly and to a lesser extent in Tanzania and Uganda. So now in the next slide that are coming, I'll be just commenting comparatively uh, on these comments, taking effects area one by one. Uh, among those countries uh, facing negative terms of trade, uh, we have, in terms of trade effects, a decline in imports in 2002, which raises the issue of rising prices and domestic supply shortages. Uh, and as you've seen in those increasing food price uh, indices, we have a decline in exports, uh, which probably may be linked to a limited capacity to respond to the rising prices in the short run and its change as we go uh, into 2024. In terms of growth effect, we have significant contraction across the board uh, in 2022. Malawi actually should go into recession with a negative growth rate in 2022 already. And all economies are seen to recover by 2024, with the exception of Uganda. In terms of employment effects, we have a lot of employment in 2022 in all countries. We have no labor market recovery in sight in Uganda, Kenya, and Malawi by 2024. Employment will rebound uh, in Senegal and Tanzania towards 24, meaning that what they have lost compared to where they would have been will be erased. But the pace of employment creation, meaning how much employment will be created over the years, is lower uh, than the trajectory of the countries were between now and 2024. And finally, the poverty effects in this group of country, we see a slower growth and employment creation in these countries, which leads to increasing poverty rates in 2022. Actually, the rates are higher and continue into 2023, stabilizing only in 2024 in Kenya and Malawi. Tanzania is the only country that will recover by 2024, and with the rising rates uh, continue in Senegal and Uganda past 2024. So no recovery in sight there. The next slide, we will look at the inflationary effects and the food security effects in the same countries. Uh, so we see a generalized inflation as well as food price inflationary pressures, and these are highest in Malawi, Uganda, and Tanzania. It is mainly food price inflation in Kenya and Senegal. In Kenya, sorry, and Senegal in, 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 in contrast actually sees lower inflationary pressures uh, as time goes by. Food security effects are highest um, in terms of uh, driven by declining incomes and rising food prices. Uh, those effects are uh, most negative and strongest in Kenya, Malawi, Uganda, and Tanzania. 
A strong income decline uh, leads in those countries to worsening food security situation in, Sen in Senegal in particular, uh, despite the absence of food price inflation. In Senegal, what's really driving the food security effects is a um, uh, decline in incomes uh, rather than just uh, food price inflation. So next slide. Now we turn to the countries with positive uh, terms of trade. And here the trade effects uh, regarding uh, 2022, um, particularly 2023, but already in 2022, we have very strong export expansion in Mozambique, uh, in Nigeria in 2023, and to a lesser extent uh, in South Africa. Uh, growth slows down uh, in 2022 due to the shocks uh, in Ghana, Mozambique, South Africa, unlike uh, in Benin and Nigeria, which experienced no contraction at all in 2022. And the improving terms of trade boosts growth across all these countries as time goes by and the economy reacts in 2023 and 2024. There's a little bit of a lack here in benefiting from the better terms of trade. We have a much stronger response, though, uh, in Mozambique, uh, in Nigeria. Across these countries, in terms of employment effects, we have stronger labor market expansion in Mozambique and Nigeria. Uh, Benin and Ghana benefit in terms of uh, market expansion, labor market expansion, the list. Uh, we have a faster pace of employment creation in Mozambique and Nigeria beyond uh, 2022. So those uh, will be expanding and uh, accelerating the pace uh, as um, these effects kick into the economy. Poverty effects, we have strong decline in poverty rates, um, uh, at, uh, sorry, stronger, it's comparative, decline in poverty rates in Benin and Nigeria, both as Ghana and South Africa. Mozambique is the only country, and I'll come back to that, with very strong positive uh, uh, terms of trade effects and yet uh, negative uh, poverty effects. So in the next slide, we look at uh, the um, uh, inflationary effects uh, and the food security effects. And here you can see that um, in um, um, these countries, we have a general uh, and food price inflationary pressures in Mozambique, uh, mainly food price inflation in Ghana and Benin, mainly in rural areas in Benin and Nigeria. And in South Africa, very low, negligible, low general, as well as food price inflation. We have food security effects in those countries, higher income households and moderate inflation. I'm sorry, higher income households and moderate inflation lead to slightly better food security effects in Nigeria, Ghana, Benin, and South Africa. As I said earlier, Mozambique is the only country in this group with a starkly deteriorating food security uh, situation. And there are lessons to really draw, draw, draw from uh, these cases of Mozambique compared to countries like Benin, both benefiting from positive export uh, market conditions compared to import market conditions. But in the case of Mozambique, with strong growth reaction uh, to these terms of trade, most of this is in highly concentrated export uh, uh, sectors uh, that are low labor, uh, in, with low labor intensity. What that means is that the employment and income gains are very narrowly distributed, concentrated in very few areas and very few people, which therefore leads to the negative uh, poverty and food security effects. Those positive terms of trade, growth and income were just not spreadly, spread widely enough. In the case of Benin, facing the same similar conditions, you have uh, uh, cotton, which is a leading export sector that gains uh, from these positive terms of trade which is a labor-intensive smallholder crops. You have broader-based growth, therefore, employment and income effects in this country, and therefore, stronger poverty outcomes. Despite uh, facing the same conditions, you have better outcomes in Benin compared to, to Mozambique. So in the last slide, uh, that's a summary, uh, which we'll skip because you've seen that mostly negative outcomes in countries with negative terms of trade and some uh, mixed outcomes in countries with um, uh, positive terms of trade. In the last slide, we have done more work than uh, just looking at the terms of trade effects. Uh, most of this will be in our uh, publication series uh, starting this weekend. We've looked at exposure and contagion uh, because most countries are affected by the trade, by the crisis without actually dealing with Ukraine or the world market. And the fertilizer sector, vegetable oils, wheat. So you can look at the website and look for this publication in the coming days. Thank you very much. And I, I think I give now the floor to IFTC.
Hi. Hello, everyone. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for that presentation, Usman, giving us uh, your perspective from Academia 2063. Again, great resource for decision makers to make some informed policy to respond to these effects. And for the recovery phase who that, that we hope can come uh, for these countries uh, soon. Um, I see some very interesting questions coming in. Please go to the Q&A tab and continue to send those. Again, um, we will have some more time at the end for a Q&A. Um, and with that, I would like to present our third uh, presenter. Up next, we have Upendra Singh from the International Fertilizer Development Center, who will tell us a little bit about ways to improve fertilizer use, uh, some of the solutions available, and some data resources. So please, Upendra, can I ask you to unmute? Uh, thank you, uh, and, and good day, everyone. Uh, before starting, I'd like to acknowledge contributions from my colleague, Lata Nagarajan, Director of USAID's Soils Consortium Program and our Global Research and Field Staff. Uh, keeping... Uh, so, can I have the next slide, please? So, keeping with the theme of timely analysis of data and information for decision making during a period of crisis, we'll focus on how such information is used for improving fertilizer use efficiency and thus providing short to long term solutions. Our objective is to improve fertilizer use efficiency using data and tools from proven, scalable soil fertility technologies and, and management practices. Uh, with the improved fertilizer use efficiency results in increased crop yields and income, cleaner environment, less wastage and optimization of resources. Uh, we believe that achieving four hours within the given limitation is the key to improve fertilizer use efficiency. Here we are talking about the right source, right timing, right rate and right place of uh, fertilizer within, as I said, the given limitations we have now. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, fertilizer use efficiency is defined as increasing production per unit applied, or one can consider as value generated per cost incurred. This definition does cover food security and uh, economic aspects. However, if you want to include uh, uh, nutritional security, environmental concerns, and soil health benefits, a better indicator for fertilizer use efficiency is fertilizer utilization by crop, that is, increase in nutrient uptake per unit fertilizer applied. Uh, data, decision support tools, management practices, and technology solutions play an important role in promoting fertility and health, and thus improving fertilizer use efficiency in short to long term. In our next slide, we'll uh, discuss uh, the importance of data and decision support tools. Data on fertilizer market trans transparency and information, this has been uh, dealt in detail by our, the previous two speakers, is critical for quick and informed decision associated with fertilizer supply and demand. Uh, science, evidence-based data, and decision support tools can identify management scenarios and their outcomes with specific land and cropping and grazing systems. Uh, we know that decision support tools utilize data on soil properties, hydrology, topography, weather, and land capability classification to assess suitability of land for a given land. And when data is combined with modeling, it can assist in short-term tactical decisions as well as determine the long-term productivity and sustainability of a given practice. For example, as, as shown in this graph uh, uh, for a long-term um, study, crop rotation of maize, fallow, soybean under conservation agricultural practice with zero till 100% residue cover and fertilization results in uh, build up soil organic carbon uh, as shown by the, uh, the orange, uh, the first uh, graph. We're seeing build up 
of soil and surface soil organic carbon. Whereas there is a decline in soil organic carbon content with the unfertilized system under conventional tillage with no residue and uh, also just with maize monocrop. So moving on to the next slide. Uh, in, here we're showing that africafertilizer.org, africafertilizerwatch.org, they provide the needs for short to medium term fertilizer market data. Since, uh, and when we look at fertilizer, africafertilizer.org, since 2009, it has been making fertilizer information in Africa available to all through partnership and data sharing mechanism that provides fertilizer statistics on production, trade, consumption, prices, production capacities, and fertilizer use background. Uh, it also provides fertilizer market intelligence on fertilizer policies and regulations, subsidy programs, business and product directories, publications, news, etc. The fertilizerwatch.org is, is, is a dashboard utilizing uh, the database from Africa fertilizer.org to track regional and country specific impacts in sub-Saharan Africa during COVID and Ukraine oil crisis, which is occurring from global fertilizer prices, limited supply inventory, and affordability at the farmer level. Uh, in the next slide, we will uh, illustrate the use of decision support tools to improve fertilizer use efficiency. And here we will take DSET, the decision support system for agrotechnology transfer, as an example. Uh, so a very quick overview of DSET. It comprises of 42 dynamic uh, crop growth simulation models, has utilities and apps for weather, soil, genetics, crop management, and observational experiment data. It's a product that has been developed by DSET Foundation, University of Florida, and IFDC. And it has been, been used for more than 30 years by researchers, educators, policy and decision makers in more than 174 countries. As an example, uh, I'm going to discuss the example of uh, use of DSET by IFDC for a Gates Foundation study on fertilizer NPK plants for Sub-Saharan Africa. Here the uh, chart, the graph on the right shows uh, for Tanzania, the 32 dominant plants were identified or recommended. However, when taking into account the logistics associated with fertilizer planting and marketing, these recommendations can be further fine-tuned to fewer manageable, manageable plants. Uh, in the case of Albania, the examples, that example is associated with the collapse of uh, Albanian economy in 1990s. And based on these recommendation, urea was imported as a viable option for late nitrogen top, top dressing of wheat to avert uh, crop failure versus uh, importing uh, versus food imports. So, uh, in our next slide, uh, we will uh, look at uh, one of the decision support tools that that's being uh, or the framework that's being developed under the USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security Program, uh, the Soils Consortium Program. Uh, here, a locally relevant framework for integrated soil health and land use management is being developed for Ethiopia and Niger. The approach uh, uses databases on climate, on soil, climate, and vegetation, as you can see in the center of the graph. And then it also combines or uh, takes works together with local on-site information, soil texture, pH, depth, slope, etc. And and combined with the use of the system support tools uh, for for land planning and crop models, it can then generate uh, site-specific targeted soil fertility and land use recommendations with the overall goal of being practical, profitable, scale appropriate in terms of uh, soil and land use management and technologies and recommendation for productive farming system. 
in terms of where we are, this approach is being tested and validated in Ethiopia for the past two years, and it can be applied to other sub-Saharan African countries for 2023. Uh, the next slide will go into more detail about the fertilizer use, uh, uh, the, the decision support tool that's being developed for Ethiopia. Uh, this focuses on improved site-specific fertilizer recommendations. Uh, and we can move to the next slide where we're looking at uh, application at uh, Oreda or district level. And um, uh, so with appropriate inputs, it's appropriate at, at district level. And in the next slide, we'll show that uh, uh, with the different sets of uh, inputs, uh, it can be also used at the farmer level. So uh, combined with crop models, uh, the decision support tools make fertilizer recommendations that lead to increased income, improve fertilizer use efficiency, and, and reduce losses. So, so this, this would be uh, the scenario and the decision support tools uh, that would be specifically developed for Ethiopia, but uh, we are uh, also planning to have it uh, available for other countries with uh, appropriate data and, and validation test. Uh, from next slide onwards, I'll focus mostly on um, uh, fertilizer management practices and technologies that improve fertilizer use efficiency. Uh, in the short to medium term, we'll focus on and promotion of fertilizer management practices such as microdosing, integrated soil fertility management, and good agricultural practices. Actually, if you look at those, uh, uh, both uh, microdosing and good agricultural practices are components of ISFM. In terms of technologies that are available and, and can be scaled up in medium to long term, uh, it includes uh, urea and pk briquette uh, particularly in countries where briquette machines are available for example bangladesh and some of the sub-saharan african countries and then uh, uh, the other two technologies are balanced fertilization uh, with use of secondary uh, and, and micro elements and then enhanced efficiency fertilizers uh, the focus, therefore, is if you look at the, the chart on the right, the focus, therefore, is on technologies and practices that are curve shifters that take us from the conventional practice to the red line. So here we see that uh, this leads to a higher yield with a similar or lower input. Or uh, if you just go across from the blue line or horizontally to the red line uh, without any yield penalty, uh, we are using, uh, we're getting similar yields with lower fertilizer use. So overall, we're looking at technologies that can improve fertilizer use efficiency. And we'll look at some of those uh, examples in the next slide. Uh, starting with the uh, integrated soil fertility management, uh, the ISFM is essentially soil fertility management practice that includes fertilizer, organic inputs, improved germplasm to maximize use efficiency of applied nutrients and improve crop productivity. I think we're all familiar with uh, the benefits of ISFM, particularly related to productivity gains, higher profitability, better yield and biomass production, reduced risk. And, and many of this is associated with increased soil organic matter the role that organic matter plays in improving uh, nutrient availability, water and nutrient use efficiency. And it also acts as a carbon sink for mitigating greenhouse gas uh, emissions. So uh, overall, if you look at uh, the figure again on the right, in spite of the scatter, we do see a positive relationship between increase in soil organic carbon content uh, and, and crop yield. So that's one of uh, uh, benefits uh, that, that we get from the integrated soil fertility management. And in the next slide, we will discuss uh, urea, briquette, uh, deep placement, uh, 
on rice, uh, where most of the on-farm trials, scale-up, etc., has taken place, uh, both uh, in Bangladesh and in Sub-Saharan Africa, the example here is for Ghana, we have seen productivity gains of 15 to 20 percent, uh, this use of uh, fertilizer, particularly urea, uh, lower nitrogen losses in terms of runoff and volatilization loss, uh, the urea savings also means there is a greenhouse gas savings. And then uh, as shown in the, the chart on the upper, upper right hand corner, we see uh, that uh, the broadcast application of urea has a much higher N2O emissions compared to UDP. So there's the additional advantage. Uh, and um, for other crops, as, uh, for example, maize, we've seen uh, up to 18% increase in, uh, or higher than 18% increase in productivity gains in Northern Ghana. The other benefit uh, from, uh, th this was done only for Bangladesh, where we have enough data for past 10 years, we were able to see that over 10 year period, there was increase in soil organic carbon, organic matter content with UDP application. Uh, I'm going to uh, move to the next two slides very quickly. Uh, and uh, one, uh, the other example of uh, improved technology is balanced uh, fertilization. Uh, this integrates, again, use of fertilizers, organic amendments, etc. It is relatively uh, site-specific, requires uh, in information at the site level, and, and the role of data and decision support tools become critical here. And as an example, we can see how much increase uh, has taken place in a doubling of, almost doubling of fertilizer use efficiency uh, when we included sulfur, zinc, and boron uh, together with NPK. Uh, so in, in conclusion, from a, uh, in, in the next slide, in conclusion, from a fertilizer perspective, uh, we want to do as much as can be done for 2022 in the short term and, and prepare for 2023 and beyond. Uh, with a um, uh, focus on agronomy, where we produce more with less, so increase fertilizer use efficiency, looking at uh, local plants or fertilizers, enhance efficiency fertilizer products where they are affordable, uh, fertilizer application and management practices such as UDP and ISFM. Uh, pretty much the, the major message is uh, promote uh, four hours aggressively, and, and be a strategic in terms of target crops and value chains uh, that provide best return on investment. And on the market side, so, uh, proper support fertilizer demand and use and have market transparency in terms of information so that quick and informed decision can be made, uh, for example, through fertilizer watch and dashboards. So uh, I will, in, the, in the last slide, I'm, I'm gonna uh, thank everyone, uh, particularly, um, Dr. Zeri Globa and Jack Stewart, who have been our USAID, uh, provided USAID support and directions uh, for the presentation and the project that I have discussed here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pendra, for another very interesting presentation. Uh, I see we have some uh, more questions coming in. Just as a reminder, you can post those on the Q&A and you can also vote for the questions that you like. Um, so right now we're gonna start the Q&A session. Um, I would like to ask um, all of our presenters, James, Usman and Upendra, to uh, turn on their cameras. We can see their faces. And I will start us off uh, with some of the questions that started coming in early on. Um, there is one that talks a little bit about uh, comparisons that to be made from the 2008 and 2009 crisis. So the question is by John, and he would like to know uh, what would be your assessment um, of the system's capacity to absorb the current crisis, given those um, comparisons to 2008-2009 crisis. I'm happy to get us started on that. It's a, it's a really good question. I think it's one which gonna, is going to plague us. Did we learn anything 
from the 2008-9 crisis that that has sort of made us and put us in a better position today. I think um, you know I can't answer all this, and I'm sure Usman and uh, Appenda have other comments to add. But um, I think th there are some policy lessons that were learned, particularly around trade restrictions. It was a somewhat different crisis um, in that. Um, uh, it was very much focused on fuel and fertilizer prices, and it was far more widespread range of products that were being adversely affected. And so this is a much narrower crisis in some respects, very particular food products. And also, yeah, and so, um, and so I think there are sort of, there are some caveats that need to add to any lessons that we try and draw. But I do think in terms of trade policy, there were very definite lessons learned. And I think also in terms of the topic for today, the decision support systems, I think what we did learn is that um, we need to move, we need analysis that is far more timely. I think there was a lot of analysis that was done in 2008-9 that was sort of completed in 2010 and 11 about the crisis. And I think what we've seen is we do need some capabilities as a profession, as a community, development community, to do sort of a rapid response analysis and to try and avoid some of the dangers of that, which is to do very narrow analyses um, and then try and draw sort of um, uh, um, policy response lessons from that. So for example, focusing in on wheat um, and just wheat uh, would lead you to think that only certain countries are vulnerable. And Usman's analysis showed that that's not, that you need to go beyond that. Um, and that also to think then that all the policy responses need to focus on addressing the wheat issue. Um, and I think we needed in these very complex crises to, to do far more complex analysis and far more comprehensive. And a lot of the questions that are coming in are saying, what about this? What about that? What haven't you taken into account? It, all fair points. I think what we've learned is that you have to try and look at all of these in their entirety. Otherwise, we become very blinkered in the policy responses. And I think we learned that from the 2008-9. Uh, crisis and we did better this time round. Um, but I, I don't know if others have comments. Thank you, uh, James. That's very good point on the timeliness of the analysis during crisis and to not allow the perfect, the enemy of the good, and actually like have some of those uh, things available for decision makers and others. Um, Usman or Upendra, do you have anything to add to this question or I can just quickly, actually, uh, as um, James was saying, uh, you know, we had uh, also food crisis uh, post-2008, I think it must have been 2011, and you compare the two, uh, in second crisis, countries actually did not resort uh, to export funds, they were better coordinated, and the impact for the world was much better. So that's a good lesson to learn from there. But also what's different this time around is post-COVID. Uh, where these countries were all shocked uh, and were just about to recover, spent a lot of money, contracted a lot of debt. So the fiscal space we have today is very different from the fiscal space we had in 2000 and 2009. So, and, and finally, uh, post-COVID as well, we have learned in the countries, however, despite a smaller fiscal space, what might work, right? In terms of social safety nets and other interventions to try and mitigate the impact of the shock. So there are lessons in, in, in both cases, what not to do, but also what might work uh, in this case. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, Upendra, anything um, uh, on this question? Otherwise, I have one for you, actually. I think we can move on. All right, awesome. Uh, so uh, Nebu uh, is asking if there are any short-term possibilities to decrease uh, fertilizer price. Um, he's uh, this person's uh, asking about the uh, the case of Ethiopian local farmers that keep on complaining about uh, the rise of fertilizer prices in their case. Uh, I'll, I'll take a shot at it. Uh, not to say. Fertilizer. In, I don't think we, we can go and talk about reducing fertilizer prices, but on the other hand, we can talk about improving the fertilizer use efficiency so that, uh, you know, uh, farmers can make better use of uh, the investment they have. So if, if they are using, uh, if they can get uh, more done with less fertilizer, uh, that, that, that's a, a one way to sort of buffer this the increases that are happening in fertilizer prices. Thank you. Um, we have another uh, question from Ezrael. Um, so 
uh, he's asking, uh, is the rise in poverty only due to price increase or are there any other factors? Um, so again, uh, another case of Ethiopia um, talks about James' presentation stating that the poverty rate has increased by 3%, but can you tell if any uh, of this is driven by things like conflict, drought, uh, floods, uh, desert locusts, or COVID? Um, all of which um, also could affect uh, household purchasing power. So I think this one's more for James, but of course, um, any of you guys can share answers. Well, I think, um, yeah, no, thanks. Thanks, Israel. Thanks. Um, and, and also, I think Tim, who later on, who asked somewhat, a somewhat similar question, but absolutely. And I think, as Usman said, what makes today quite quite particular is that many countries are facing multiple challenges at the same time, multiple crises, and the ones that Israel listed for Ethiopia are, are, um, should all be taken into account and included. Um, I think, you know, we're not in this particular analysis because we're focusing in on the, um, we're focusing in on uh, the global crisis driven by particularly the Russia-Ukraine war and some of the trade decisions that have been made over the last 12 months. But but certainly, um, as I was talking about, as we move from phase one to phase two of our analysis, we're, we're certainly looking to focus more on what's happening within individual countries and the many constraints that governments face to act or the many competing needs that governments have for their policy. The one thing I would add, because I know, um, you know, obviously in the Horn of Africa, drought is a very big concern at the moment. And we have done some analysis and, and now trying to bring together COVID, the, um, COVID, the um, the Ukraine crisis and also the drought. And so in Kenya, for example, our estimates are that, you know, Kenya has lost anywhere between one and two years of development effectively um, between now and 2030 as a result of these three shocks happening um, just in this very short space of time. And so it's going to take a big effort to um, claw back what has been lost as a result of these three crises together. So we're starting uh, to put these crises together and think about what they mean for our development priorities and challenges going forward. And one more thing that I would add, because everyone always forgets, in many, many of the countries, it's not just climate and conflict and, and weather and so on. It's, um, it's also a macroeconomic crisis. Many countries in Africa are facing tremendous debt burdens at the moment. Think Ghana. Um, and they're having to deal with these you know, unwinding of their debt burdens or managing their debt burdens at a time when they're facing all these crises as well. A, a debt burden of their own making, but, but having to deal with it at the same time. And there are also a number of policies that countries like Ethiopia, for example, having to increase the price of fuel. It's possible fuel was underpriced for some time before the conflict, and this conflict revealed the unsustainability of that um, of some of those earlier policy decisions. So there are many, many factors at play in many countries, but the macroeconomic crisis that many of them are facing that have been building for many years shouldn't be underestimated as well. Thanks. Thank you, James. Anything to add, uh, Usman or Upendra? Not from me. I think the, the response was uh, uh, up to the point. So perfect. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Um, another question that has uh, a lot of likes um, comes from Mio, um, and it's also speaking about uh, another crisis. So uh, they want to know what are the impacts of climate change on food security um, in those 19 countries? So I'm guessing that's uh, speaking to, to James, but also Usman, um, what, are, what are some of those uh, mm, changes in, in, in food security uh, in, the, in the commodities that you looked at, and also Pendra, um, you can chime in as well on the um, like changes in the, in the um, uh, fertilizer uh, prices and the use. It's a big you question. Maybe I'll pass it to Usman. <laughs> yes, let, let me get started. Just say, you, you know, um, the uh, one thing about climate change is that uh, you have the long-term trends. Where in the short run, you have just swings up and down. Uh, you may have a good year and a bad year, uh, or within a good year, some parts will have you know very you know bad uh, droughts or or, uh, or, or, or floods. Uh, just look at the Horn of Africa right now, northeast of Ch uh, Kenya. James was talking about that, right? So climate change is uh, having a, um, a huge impact uh, in both directions. Sometimes um, 
uh, it may improve the conditions. Sometimes it may worsen them. Uh, if you're in a dry, you know, dry area and you have, you know, uh, above average rains, of certainly something that's good for you. But those swings make life uh, uh, bad because then they're not symmetrical. When things go down, you don't recover as much uh, uh, to get back uh, to where you, where you need to be. What is important uh, to uh, when we think about climate change is are countries prepared uh, to deal with that? And in general, African countries are exposed like everywhere else on the globe, but they tend to have weaker capacities to deal with uh, climate change and therefore they're much more vulnerable. That's really the bottom line here. And now, what can they do? Um, they're going to have these shocks that are coming that can be devastating for some communities. But there are uh, options uh, for adapting, for uh, mitigating these shocks. Uh, in, I think if we've just asked IFDC, they'll be talking about fertilizers. But in the area of agronomic research, more drought tolerant crops, more salt tolerant, more nitrogen efficient crops, uh, and uh, of course, uh, pest, uh, pest uh, resistance crop and so on and so forth. So there's a lot that can be done there. But also the last thing that we also need to do, or the next thing, is to have really a good understanding of vulnerability across our communities. Uh, we have, you know, low-lying, uh, long-term uh, vulnerabilities, chronic vulnerabilities that come to the fore in terms of shocks. If you can address those, that makes us more resilient. But also we need to have the social safety net and social protection programs in place to deal with climate change. It's here for the longest of time, uh, and therefore it's not just a problem to deal with now, but a problem to deal with in the future. Thank you. Anything to add, James Rupendra? Uh, actually, in, in terms of climate change, I think one of the key things is uh, uh, the, uh, how do we make system more climate resilience? What technologies, what tools we have that can help us uh, achieve that? Uh, and and uh, one of the uh, management practices, the integrated soil fertility management, uh, with uh, improved soil organic matter carbon content, etc., provides some degree of resilience in terms of uh, uh, improving the water use efficiency, uh, making uh, more of uh, basically getting more inputs out of your more out of your inputs. Uh, so, so that's one approach. The other thing, again, it also comes down to data and decision support tools because if you want to see which areas are going to be vulnerable in, in the long term. We do have to look at uh, some of the long term trends that will happen. So th then uh, some of the, like Osman mentioned, in, in some areas, uh, you will have to look at uh, what are the genetic adaptations? What, what crops are uh, better uh, suited uh, for that environment? So you know, that, that the adaptation components becomes very important in terms of uh, dealing with climate change. Thanks. Absolutely. And if I, can, if I can just jump yeah. in very quickly and, and building on, on what others have just said, I mean, I think um, I'm a strong believer that, you know, there's a great deal of uncertainty that's coming from long-term climate change, as Osman said. Um, but I do think um, uh, having ourselves adopt more of a risk-based approach to analyzing policy options and so on, and also providing, you know, helping build the capacity of decision makers to, to factor risk into their decisions today because of weather, for example, as Usman said, would get us a long way towards preparing for what may eventually happen as a result of climate change. And so I think, you know, coming back to the topic of today, you know, some of these decision-making tools that Usman, Apendra, and myself, and, and I see many of the organizations on the list, many of them also have um, sort of their own decision-making tools and, and roles to play in advising policies. I think making sure that governments have these tools in hand and that they are ready to use, I think that is absolutely crucial um, for, for sort of managing risk, that already starting to look at alternative pathways as opposed to sort of fiercely advocating for a single policy as being absolutely the right way to go. I think we need to recognize that a lot of these are quite vulnerable to things that may happen in the future. The one thing I do just want to say is, once we look at climate variability and we think about where we might have been, so, so coming back to this analysis on the years lost, if we look at where we think, for example, Kenya might have been in 2030, um, you know, depending on the weather, we could hit that target or miss it by one to two years on either side, uh, generally because of weather variability over 10 years. 
the crises that we are facing today have pushed us right way outside that one year uncertainty of where we might be because of weather. And so these crises together um, are, are sort of outside the norm. These are, are particular um, crises and they require, um, and, and they just highlight the importance of having these tools, not relying too much on history, but also starting to think about how future markets and, and country food systems are changing and factoring that into our decision, regular decision making. Sorry. Thanks. Thank you for that. Um, so another question, question came in about the prices of food, fuel and fertilizer not being independent. I think that's why uh, we grouped them uh, for the theme month and, and a lot, it was coming from a lot of places that were also grouping them together. Um, so the question is, how are you accounting for possible spillover on the effect of uh, one or the other? I think it was explained in some of the presentations, but maybe um, another and more in-depth uh, explanation of that here. I'm happy to, happy to go. I think the question came in during my presentation, but I think it also applies to, to others. Um, I know obviously the impacts of, on fertilizer prices will eventually affect food prices as well. And certainly I think the, one of the examples I was giving in the chat was uh, fuel prices are incredibly important for all commodities um, because they raise the cost of transport. And so that is, a, that is a, a price increase that's over and above the price, the world price of, um, of fertilizer or foods. So there's an example of how fuel prices are interacting and adding to the stresses that are being felt in other parts of the economy or for other products. Um, in our analysis, and I can only speak to the modeling, but this is exactly what we try and take into account. So we're tracking all these different supply chains and value chains um, across the economy, and we're building up their costs of production. And in addition to the price of raw materials, many of which are imported, or fertilizers, many of which are imported in many countries, we've also got to factor in that added cost of, um, of getting goods to market or from market to, to the border ready for export. And we try and take that analysis into account. That is particularly important. Um, and and you know, if we were only facing a wheat price crisis today, um, we probably wouldn't need our overly complex models. But because we're dealing with prices that are affecting domestic markets and a whole range of products, we need these more complex tools in our, in our toolkit and ready to use. I'll stop there, thanks. Anything from uh, Usman or Pendra? And I think that's perfect, so, so we have more time for more questions. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, so there is another question from Aldin. Um, do you expect that the drought in the US and Europe will lead to less grain export and further challenges uh, to the food security elsewhere? I'm afraid I'm I'm very squarely a country specialist and work mainly in, in lower income countries despite living in the US. Um, we don't have our global trade uh, specialists well, from IFBRI, sorry, on the call and, and I'd leave it to others to, to add their thoughts. But I can imagine again, as we think about crisis after crisis in many, many countries layering upon themselves, I can't imagine this could be anything other than another stressor that the, the global food system is gonna have to face and certainly isn't gonna help bring prices down. But yeah, I'll stop there. Okay, so um, I have one that's uh, very interesting coming from Patrick. Um, so he's saying uh, negative impacts from the Ukraine crisis to Africa is worrying, especially on food security. High costs of fertilizer and lack of subsidies may further uh, the poverty levels by 2024. Um, do you guys have any long-term policy recommendations for governments? Um, let me start with this one. Um, actually, we just got uh, um, a, a, a report on that ready to go. Probably uh, by Friday, you could find on our website. They're looking at the shots in the fertilizer sector um, uh, and how you know much prices have changed and how much uh, fertilizer use has gone down across these 10 countries. There's a real shock uh, in terms of uh, consumption of fertilizers which affect in those countries, productivity of crops and output in agriculture sector and the growth of the economies. So, um, you know, uh, what I often do in my case, when I have a problem, I look at where do I have a similar situation where there is a solution. Uh, and in, in most of uh, these countries, what we have seen across Africa, 
is that we are worried about cereals. But cereal ranks among the top fertilizer using commodities only in a handful of countries. For most countries, it's uh, your higher value crops, your tea, your coffee, uh, your fruits and vegetables uh, that are using these fertilizers. And outside of maybe tea and coffee, and certainly fruits and vegetables across Africa, you don't have government interventions in the fertilizer sectors, and they work quite fine. Of course, they have a, a big um, uh, purchasing power uh, to buy fertilizers. If you're thinking about the long run, create the conditions for cereal farmers and other farmers to be able to afford the cost of fertilizers. Uh, create the conditions for them to get, a, get better market prices. Uh, create the conditions for a, a thriving private sector around them uh, for the markets to work. So you can get that at least happening uh, in your country. So create the bigger conditions like you have in sectors in every country where the fertilizer markets are working. That may not solve your problem, but will, re will reduce the risk you have to deal with as a country. Uh, and we're not in a position here to give a, a, a general uh, um, uh, um, indication of how to do that, but at least you can reduce the risk that you have to deal with once you create the space for the private sector to work for the farmers to get better prices and the cost of delivering uh, these fertilizers. We have uh, embraced uh, uh, subsidies where they work. Uh, we have to make them sustainable. But what's really the bottom line here, uh, just like we've seen in sectors that work, is that you need a private sector that works day in, day out on getting fertilizers at cost competitive cost uh, prices to the farmers everywhere across the country. That should be the long term solution, and that's what we should be working on. Thank you. Anything to add from James or Pendra here? Okay, I have uh, something that is going to be for Upendra, likely, um, and it's talking, uh, there's actually a couple of questions coming in that are related to organic agriculture. Um, so this person, Ulrich, is asking about whether or not we have looked at organic agriculture, production of organic fertilizers and compost as means to improve resilience against um, these external shocks. Um, in, in, in any uh, quantitative way. And also another question from Michelle, um, which is related, um, talking about uh, the fact that small uh, farmers produce uh, a large amount of the food consumed globally and FAO recommending national policy focus on agroecology. Um, then the question is, why are we not or import fertilizers or monoculture? How can such a model be analyzed in terms of sustainable agriculture management? So I think, Upendra, this one uh, you can lead us with. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, uh, yes, I mean, generally, we expect that uh, uh, addition of organic fertilizers, uh, manure, compost, etc., cetera, uh, would help in terms of... Uh, climate resilience, building soil health, uh, and, and use efficiency of uh, all the inputs, uh, whether it's fertilizer, seeds, uh, water, et cetera. Uh, the, the major issue that comes is uh, the availability of the, uh, so if you start looking at sub-Saharan Africa, where, uh, where most of us focus on uh, for this particular uh, scenarios on fertilizer crisis, there, the availability of organic amendments are a major issue. Uh, and, and, there, and that's one reason wh why we are promoting ISFM, the Integrated Soil Fertility Management, because um, without having a decent uh, productivity, you can't be producing enough biomass for composting, uh, adding back as a residue to the, uh, to the soil and so forth. So I think that that component needs to be taken into account. And again, uh, this is very site specific. Uh, I mean, in, in general, but, but it will apply to most of the sub-Saharan African countries. But if you move out of sub-Saharan Africa, then there are opportunities for recycling, uh, use of organic fertilizers. And even in the urban areas, uh, where if you go to Nairobi and Accra, uh, the mega cities in sub-Saharan Africa, there are opportunities to recycle um, waste and, and uh, use that as uh, nutrient sources. 
So uh, the, the idea here is not to just focus on fertilizers, but uh, in majority of the cases, fertilizers are the starting point for starting to, uh, to increase the productivity, to increase the biomass production, root biomass, above ground biomass, et cetera. So uh, that's, uh, that one, that's one uh, component that we do need to keep in mind. Uh, so the resilience part is, is critical. Um, now, uh, Alejandro, what was the second question related to Soria? Uh, was it more policy related or? Sorry, I've missed that. Yeah, let me check it again. Um, uh, okay, so since FAO recommended national policy focus okay. on agroecology, uh, which doesn't use imported fertilizer or monoculture, how can such a model be analyzed in terms of sustainable agricultural management? Okay, uh, very good question. And, and uh, again, you know, this this is where the uh, agroecology, uh, regenerative agriculture, organic farming. I think uh, we have to be looking at it on a site specific basis. Uh, and, and this is where, you know, the climate information, the soil input information, all that will play a role in terms of uh, saying whether um, one can practice the, the recommended system in those areas or not, you know. So, so that's, uh, again, you know, um, that's why, I mean, uh, I, I keep re-emphasizing the role of data because much of the uh, management decisions are very site specific. We cannot make a blanket recommendation in terms of uh, where the agroecological solutions will work. You know, I mean, at, at, um, at, as I mentioned, if the system is sustainable, if we have enough soil organic matter content and so forth, I think we have a lot more to play with than in a system where you are at the poverty line. Well, you have to build up that uh, level of uh, nutrients, organic matter content, etc., in, in the soil. So soil health, uh, at the end of the day, is critical. You know, soil health in, in the poverty level, in, and also soil health where there are excessive uses of nutrients. So we have to be paying a lot more attention to soil health. And I'm I'm glad that uh, the global community has finally started to look into soil health at the level that they are doing right now. Thank you very much for that. Yes. Can, can I ask a question of Apendra? Because I know, um, you know, Usman gave a very eloquent um, exposition of our future, our long-term needs and what are the long-term goals for African agriculture. And I think certainly this crisis has raised a lot of attention for fertilizer use efficiency as a very necessary goal. Um, but I'm wondering, and, and, and I know there's a lot of uh, focus on improving fertilizer use efficiency in the current crisis as a potential response. But how long do you think it would take? Like, are we talking 24 months before we would get a significant enough shift in fertilizer use, use efficiency. I mean, it's it's just a question that I've had every time I've heard this is, is this really even a medium term response? We hope it is, but but in, in your assessment, is that true? Uh, and here I'll have to, sorry, Upendra, be the bad guy in the moderator, but we have about one more minute for that response. <laughs> sorry, okay. thank you. Um, all right, uh, basically uh, the answer is yes. I mean, there are uh, management practices that can be taken off off the shelf and implemented. Uh, uh, so uh, the timing of fertilizers, the balanced fertilization, if you know we have the data in indicating whether we have soil acidity problem or something like that. I mean, if we fix some of those things, salinity, acidity, so forth, uh, that would double the fertilizer use efficiency in some instances. So yes, and the answer is yes, short. Thank you very much. Um, I have one question that you guys can answer via chat for people because I think it's interesting. Again, very quick. What are other policy tools potential to utilize other than cash transfers, food tax relief to offset poverty impacts? I think we can answer those via chat. And with that, I'm going to give the floor to Alan Tollervy, Agriculture Team Research and Evidence Division at UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Alan, thank you so much for being here. Um, and please go ahead and unmute to close us off on today. Yeah, I'm unmuted, Alondra. And, and it could, it great you take that picture time, actually. Um, uh, it's pretty off-putting, actually. Yeah, thanks. Um, 
Yeah, brilliant talk. I'm Alan Tolivy. I work for in FCDO with uh, in Research and Evidence Division. So my boss is the FCDO Chief Scientist, Charlotte Watts, and um, and we fund research. Basically, is what we do. And and I work in the, the food and agriculture team. So we've been working closely with USAID, with Chris uh, Hilbrunner and other colleagues to to um, uh, provide short-term resources to, to IFPRI and other partners, academia, sorry, um, as well to fund, you know, analysis to support the, the, the an understanding of this crisis as it unfolds. And um, and as, I guess as thanks for the presentations. I thought they were really interesting, and the discussion was was really excellent. Um, uh, and insightful, and and to some extent, a very stimulating. But to some extent, you know, it sets out the scale of the challenge. And I, and I took three things really from it. Firstly, you know, the the title of the presentation was, you know, time, timely analysis for decision making during a crisis. Um, uh, you know, you could subtext that as you know, avoiding doing the wrong thing, which is always the objective of any. Uh, you know, person advising policymakers stop them doing something bad in immediate response. And I think that I took you know three main issues. One is uh, homogeneity. I mean, the thing is that responses in different places are very different. If you look at an economy-wide level, um, you know, as James set out and and Usman set out, we're looking at very different um, trajectories of impact across different economies, different sectors being impacted, and different. Commodity price rises ha affecting different economies in different ways, and and uh, Upendra, you know, showed very clearly that if you look across a, an agroecology or a, a, a geographic area, we can see, you know, we need to tailor responses to specific problems. The second thing is that we need to look at you know, both the short, immediate response, but then that immediately feeds into those questions that came up just at the end there, you know, from James, for example, but others had asked the same question. Looking, you know, what's the medium? What, this is the immediate crisis, but what's the medium and what's the long term? And, and if I was at a presentation recently, I think it was with IFPRI actually, when a present, you know, there was a graph showing the food shocks, food price shocks that have hit us over the last 10 or 15 years. And there's a repeated series of these 2008, 2011, and now 2022. And 21, actually, because, you know, food prices have been rising steadily for a year. And 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 the third thing is it has the, the the policy response has to be done very quickly and presented to people in in a, in a form and at a time that they can use it to make decisions. So those three things, um, being able to look across economies, being able to look within economies, being able to look at short, medium, and long term impacts, and being able to provide that information to people, the real the people that make decisions. In a time that they can utilize, it requires capacity. And, and the key lesson I take from this is we've underinvested in the capacity across the world to be able to do this analysis, to, to identify and analyze risks that run across the food system, not just associated with you know shocks or conflict associated with shocks, which avoid us focusing on the wrong thing, wheat stuck in Black Sea ports, for example, but look at things like fertilizer and fuel. And enable us to provide without having to panic and rush around scrabbling together funds to do short term analysis, but, but build the capacity to do that in a more sustained way. And I think, you know, we said the same in 2008, we said the same in 2011, and here we are again, you know, looking to IFPRI and, and to other partners to do the really excellent analysis they're, they're doing. But having to, you know, call in their resources, call in people, and and put a lot of pressure on them. So, you know, what I take from this is we need to do this a lot better. These things aren't going away. They're not just associated with, you know, a, a shock like the Ukraine-Russia conflict. They're associated with long-term threats to uh, food systems and to economies. Many people have made that point in the chat. Um, and you know, what we pledge to do is to try to convince our our organization and the people that we work with that we need to you know supply more funding to the institutions that are able to do that for us and to build that global capacity so thanks very much it's a great presentation and really interesting analysis and that's the big take home point from me thanks 
you very much, Alan, for that. Thank you for uh, that great summary of what was a great event. Uh, please, um, that's 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 actually how we conclude the event. So thank you to everyone who came and gave us your time. Please keep going to the AgriLinks page on the theme month for more info. Uh, I know for a fact that we have some a couple of blogs being posted today. Thank you to Chris, James, Usman, Upendra, and Alan for giving us such important insights. Special thanks to the wonderful AgriLinks team, uh, Michael Saltz, Shantis McCorkle, and Casey Foley. Um, we hope to see you guys again soon. Thank you for having